to start this presentation by uh, starting with a disclaimer. I'm not an astronomer, uh, although I've had an active interest in astronomy uh, since I was a child. Um, the reason why I've ended up coming to present on this topic of rubble pile asteroids uh, is a rather circuitous route that I will describe a little later uh, in the presentation. And it all relates to a colleague of mine at the University of Uruguay, a physicist. Uh, who's interested in studying asteroids, who decided to take up the challenge of using discrete element modeling to model asteroid formation, uh, and decided to make use of thesis particle, which is of course the uh, discrete element modeling code that myself and some of my former colleagues uh, continue to develop as an open source software. Uh, he got a grant with the Uruguay National Science Home Foundation, uh, which uh, myself and my partner Stefan Arbe uh, were um, partner investigators and that resulted in a visit to Uruguay last year uh, to help him to implement uh, self-gravity in Mises Particle. Um, I've had a few disasters in preparing these slides, uh, including uh, uh, the slides not being copied to my USB stick this morning, but thanks to my uh, lovely partner T Tanya, I've managed to get a copy of the slides. There's not that many of them, um, so this is not Tim the presentation I'll be presenting next week uh, at the Astronomy Association, but parts of it might be. So, um, Tim, you're free to pick and choose what you would like me to present. And, and for part of it, you'll just have to listen to me talking because I don't have too many pictures. Um, I'm going to address five questions uh, fairly simply. We're just going to do a who, what, why, where, when, and how. Uh, so, what are asteroids? Where are they found? What are asteroids made of? How asteroids studied, and that's where we'll spend uh, a little bit of time talking about these particle issues, um, and also who should be concerned about asteroids. Now, I'm sure there's a number of people in the room that also have another question in mind. Can we mine asteroids? <laughs> um, that's a contentious topic. It's an interesting topic, but it's uh, too broad to discuss that in this presentation. So uh, I think we'll do that for another time. Uh, and I'm probably not the best person to present on that. There are other people in there, so I'll look at that. So what are asteroids? I certainly hope this is not what comes to mind. <laughs> we won't be talking about how to escape the empire in an uh, uh, asteroid field today. Uh, so asteroids, they actually vary in form. They're essentially rocks and, uh, and dusty objects um, that uh, orbit the sun or, uh, or uh, have eccentric orbits within uh, the solar system and elsewhere uh, in the universe. Uh, they vary from uh, spherical bodies like uh, the largest dwarf, uh, larger, one of the largest of the dwarf planets, Ceres. Uh, so that's in the asteroid belt. That's a differentiated dwarf planet, uh, which means that it has actually remelted at some point, and heavy elements have sunk to the core of. Uh, uh, of that uh, dwarf planet, and the lighter elements have uh, uh, risen through solid state convection to upper layers, so it's broken up into layers, much the same way that the Earth is. Uh, it's about 900 kilometers across. Uh, these are a little bit more like what we typically see in science fiction movies. Uh, so this is uh, uh, Eros, I believe. Uh, they, they can be quite irregular. Of course, they have evidence of impacts from other smaller asteroids. Uh, and planetary bodies. Um, and this looks like a solid body, but in fact it has a very thick megalith, so it's essentially a whole lot of dust, soil. Uh, and even smaller asteroids like Itakawa uh, here, which we'll talk about quite a bit in this presentation, are in fact not consolidated bodies at all. They're actually unconsolidated agglomerates and uh, of, of uh, smaller rocks and dust. Uh, and some gases as well. And if we look in closely, uh, that could just be a pile of rocks uh, uh, in a mining kind of scenario. Hands up someone who wants to volunteer to run split over a damage. <laughs> you know, tell us the size distribution. <coughs> it looks like it would actually be pretty good. How do we know that this actually came from there? Well, if you look closely at the, uh, the shadows, and this is always a, a good trick when you're looking at astronomy photos of other planets, look at the edges of the shadows. On Earth, due to our atmosphere, shadows actually have a slightly fuzzy uh, appearance, uh, even though it's uh, rather hard to see. But uh, in the deepest space, with no atmosphere, we get very sharp 
uh, shadow lines uh, because there's no uh, uh, diffraction of the light. Other evidence of the fact that there are, in fact, asteroids, which are just piles of rocks that decide to hang out together in space, uh, are these Carter crater chains. Don't try and say that too fast. <laughs> uh, on the surface of Ganymede, for example, where uh, an asteroid, which was uh, a rubble pile comprised of many smaller chunks, uh, has uh, impacted with the surface of Ganymede, one of the, uh, the moons of Jupiter, am I right? Yes. Um, and uh, formed a whole series of craters because the various different chunks have actually split apart from each other. Uh, as asteroids of this type approach uh, large bodies like Jupiter, uh, they get tidally disrupted through gravity, uh, so they start to get pulled apart by the gravitational field in the, uh, uh, in the uh, uh, region of those uh, massive bodies. Uh, there are very, very many telescopic and satellite imagery uh, of asteroids which are quite uh, strange in shape. Uh, we talk about contact binaries and dumbbell shapes amongst asteroids. One of the most interesting, I guess, pieces of evidence for rubble pile asteroids, however, is this plot here, which is plotting the spin rate of different asteroids versus their diameter. And uh, there's clearly two populations here. Down here, we're in the 100 meters or less kind of range. Uh, a lot of these are probably individual rocks flying around uh, and uh, getting down into more dusty kind of arenas. These are the 100 meter to 100 kilometer sized uh, uh, asteroids, much like this guy here. And what we can see is that there's actually a limit, an upper limit on the spin rate of most of these asteroids. And uh, physicists like to name things fancy names that don't mean anything to pretty much everybody. So this is called the cohesion or spin barrier. But what it basically means is that if we have an unconsolidated mass of, of rubble that's basically being held together under gravity and it's spinning, if it spins too fast, it'll blow itself apart. It'll basically fly apart. Uh, so if it's cohesionless, so the material doesn't stick to itself, uh, and we spin it, there is a maximum rate of spin that can be achieved before that thing flies apart. And uh, we see in the data, this is experimental data, that in fact the bulk of the asteroids display this cohesion or spin uh, barrier, which suggests that indeed they are unconsolidated piles of rocks. It wouldn't be a JK seminar without a size distribution, so here we go. Um, so uh, the size distribution of asteroids, uh, physicists again, are, are typically different to everybody else. So of course the number of asteroids is on the x-axis, so the size of asteroids is on the uh, y-axis here, uh, which is of course the opposite to what we would normally do, but regardless of that, this is a log-log plot, and we can see that for all intents and purposes, the sizes of aster asteroids varying from one asteroid greater than 900 kilometers in diameter, which is our good friend Ceres, through to hundreds of millions of asteroids of about uh, 100 meters in diameter. Uh, there's a good power law relationship across all of those scales. So harking back to my previous JK seminar, this is an example of a fractal, yet again. I really like this diagram on this side here. Uh, so what they're doing here is they're basically showing the cumulative volume, summing up all of the volumes of all of the asteroids of each of these sizes. So we've got one asteroid the size of Ceres, and then we've got about two or three asteroids about 500 kilometers in diameter. So if we join those together, what we get is something which has basically the same volume as Ceres. And then as we go down through the smaller sizes, we can see how that cumulative volume actually uh, uh, ascribes to the various sizes of asteroids there. Another way of looking at it uh, is to compare it to some other bodies that we might be familiar with. So here's Mars uh, and Mercury and Earth's moon. And then here's Ceres, which is about 900 kilometers in diameter, uh, and Vesta, which is the next largest at around 500 kilometers in diameter. Uh, here's Vesta again uh, with some of the smaller guys. Uh, so uh, uh, you can see some irregular shapes, some dumbbell type shapes here, contact binaries. And there's a tiny dot down there that you can't really see, which is this Itakawa, which was that asteroid, rubble pile asteroid I shared the image of before. Um, okay, so 
some physical attributes uh, of various asteroids or some of the largest asteroids. Uh, Vesta uh, uh, comes in at, uh, let's see, a diameter of around 525 kilometers. It's at an orbital radius of 2.36 astronomical units. One astronomical unit is the distance of the Earth from the Sun, which is about 150 or a million kilometers. Um, so Vesta is sitting out in the asteroid belt as is Ceres and Pallas and uh, Hygieia as well. Uh, orbital periods takes roughly four and a half to five years for uh, asteroids to orbit the Sun. They're pretty much in the ecliptic, uh, which means that they follow the same kind of plane of orbital motion as, as most of the planets. Um, masses, uh, uh, in terms of diameters, uh, these larger guys are, are a fraction of the size of the moon in, in most cases. Uh, densities are interesting. Um, basically, uh, they're all around uh, two to three or three and a half. Uh, uh, tons per meter cubed, so they're basically rocks for all, uh, all intents and purposes. Fairly short rotation periods in hours, uh, so uh, Hygieia has got a 27 hour day, but Vesta only a 5 hour day. Surface temperatures are a little chilly for my liking, uh, about minus 70 degrees Celsius on average. Uh, so take your, uh, your sweater. Okay, where do we find them? Uh, so this is a, a sketch of our solar system with the Sun at the center and Mercury, Venus, Earth and Mars and, and Jupiter marked. The vast majority of the asteroids are in the asteroid belt, uh, which is between Jupiter and Mars, uh, and most of them are here. Uh, these asteroids, uh, for the most part, are considered to be remnants of a uh, planetesimal that started forming uh, in an orbit between Jupiter and Mars during the early stages of the solar system within the first uh, 500 million years or so of the solar system's history. Uh, at that time, Jupiter was actually further away from the Sun. But as, as Jupiter gathered mass, it started to fall in towards the Sun. Uh, and as it did that, it brought a, a, uh, a gravity field with it, which essentially destroyed that protoplanetesimal before it had a chance to fall, fully form into a planet. Uh, it basically shattered it, and in about a billion years after uh, the, uh, the start of the solar system formation, uh, we have evidence here on Earth in Hadean crust uh, of uh, massive impact events. Uh, what do they call that, John, again? It's the, um, the late bombardment or something? Pass. Yeah, <laughs> what about Atlas? Do you remember that part of the world? Secretatious. Secretatious, is it? Okay. In any case, uh, there was a late bombardment which is recorded in Earth's geological history uh, and that is possibly associated with some of the fragments that got blown off this planetesimal when it was destructed by uh, the gravity waves from, from Jupiter. When you say like, how late? I thought it was about a billion years in. Like three years, yeah, not the point. That's before the rotation. Four hours time. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> there were some rotations that were no <laughs> critters around us. No. There was one later that killed all the critters, I remember mean, that. Uh, well, we'll get to that one. You can pronounce that one, by the way. I'm not going to try to pronounce it. Uh, so, um, so we've got these remnants of, of a planetesimal, so they're fragments of a, of a planet. Uh, some of them have redifferentiated, as I said, like in the series. Uh, there are also uh, some major groupings of asteroids that they call Trojans. Uh, in Greeks, but Trojans are the, the common name for them. They actually orbit the Sun in the same orbit as Jupiter, and they're essentially trapped in Jupiter's gravitational wake. So they get dragged around with Jupiter, uh, because Jupiter is quite a massive body compared to all the other solar system bodies except the Sun. So it has quite a gravitational influence on, on the, the way the solar system works. Uh, and they're suspected to be probably the best examples of remnants of the primordial cloud where all of the planets and the sun uh, uh, accreted out of about 4.3 billion years ago. Uh, so there is in fact plans for a NASA mission, assuming Donald Trump stays out of the, the way, uh, to send a probe to one of the Trojans uh, to sample it, as well as to study it with various uh, imaging technologies to get a bit more of an understanding of the building blocks of the solar system from these, uh, these Tro Trojan asteroids. 
Uh, there are also, as you can see here, a number of other wanderers that wander around the solar system in rather eccentric orbits in some cases. Some of them are Earth grazers or near-Earth asteroids that cross Earth's orbit at various times. Uh, and we'll talk a bit about the threat of asteroids a bit later on. Uh, so what are they made of? Um, interestingly, we actually have quite a lot of samples of, of asteroids here on the planet because uh, many of the meteorites that, uh, that strike the Earth and, and manage to make it to surface are in fact uh, of asteroid origin. Um, Ceres, as I said, is a dwarf planet in its own right. It's differentiated, so it has a rocky core and icy mantle. Uh, Ceres is really quite interesting. It has the capacity for plate tectonics because its mantle is almost entirely frozen water ice. Uh, so it, uh, uh, it displays isotopsy. That's the uh, ability of uh, uh, heavy mountains to actually sink downwards into the mantle. That happens here on Earth as well. Uh, and uh, it also displays some evidence of large-scale deformations on the surface as well. Uh, Vesta is another interesting one. It has a very high density. It has a nickel-iron core and a basaltic mantle and all their crust. Sound a little bit familiar. Um, that's not good. You're going to play nicely with me or not? Okay, where was I? Okay, Vesta um, has a uh, uh, nickel iron core. Um, it also displays signs that it's been squeezed. It has these large ridges around its, its edge. Um, I'm just going to close PowerPoint and try again here. Um, basically, we can divide asteroids up into a number of different classes. I'm just going to go through my notes here. Uh, they can be broadly classified into three different classes. Um, let's see if I can get it. Woohoo! The back. Let's go back one. Okay, back to where we were. Alice, that's how you deal with disasters. I was just <laughs> taking notes. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to come up take an idea that for you really talk. <laughs> Very well. Okay, so there's Vesta. These are the ridges uh, along its length. The, 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 it's suspected that it's undergone some kind of tidal uh, effects during its formation. Uh, from meteorites, uh, if we cut into them, we often find that in fact they have quite an interesting structure. They have these spherules, or chondrules as they're called, uh, which are, are typically nickel iron uh, uh, metallic chondrules in a matrix of silicates, oxides, and sulfides. Olivine in certain uh, certain time being the most common. Um, obviously, geologists have been involved with all the names that are here, uh, but uh, essentially we can break them down into three different classes by composition. There's the carbonaceous, 75% of asteroids are carbonaceous, uh, comprised primarily of clay and stony silicates. Uh, so I, I would say salacious, but. Silicatious, 17% silicates and, and, and uh, nickel iron. Uh, and then we have nickel iron metallic uh, asteroids as well that are around 8% and then there's some, some other stuff floating around out there as well. Iron meteorites are 91% iron, 8.5% uh, nickel and 0.6% copper. I'm, I'm guessing that uh, uh, that's got eyes uh, lighting up in, uh, in terms of recovery numbers. Uh, stony meteorites, 
uh, have 6% oxygen, 26% iron, 80% silica, magnesium, ADM, nickel, calcium. These numbers actually pretty much reflect the abundances of these different metals on Earth as well. In fact, uh, across the whole solar system uh, for the rocky bodies, uh, these high numbers are pretty much the, the relative abundances of these, both on Earth and elsewhere. Uh, obviously, if you can find a meteorite which is 91% iron, and the rest of it is pretty much nickel and cobalt, uh, that would be a target for mining uh, if you can overcome all the other challenges associated with that. How asteroids studied, the most obvious one of course is telescopes, that's how the bulk of the large asteroids were discovered, essentially by taking, uh, by carefully observing the locations of bodies in telescopes in the 1800s, quite a number of the larger asteroids were found to be moving across in front of the, the star field behind, and that's how they were found. Of course now we have much larger telescopes, both ground based and, and, uh, and orbital telescopes that we can use to image asteroids directly. We have the meteorites that we can study. Um, and uh, in addition, there are a whole range of satellite missions that have uh, either waved to asteroids on the way past to somewhere else, or have actually uh, visited the asteroids, landed on asteroids, and even returned samples to Earth from asteroids. Uh, some of the satellite and probe missions that have been around, uh, there's a sample return mission underway at the moment to asteroid, asteroid Bennu, it's called Osiris Rex. Hayabusa, we'll come back to in a minute. Uh, then the JAXA, the, the Japanese Space Agency, have been uh, quite big in this area. Uh, there's an asteroid flyby mission, uh, Procyon, that happened in 2014. Uh, NASA's uh, Dawn Orbiter uh, visited Ceres and Vesta and actually went into orbit around them. Uh, there was a comet met, uh, mission, Rosetta, by the European Space Agency that flew past uh, a couple of asteroids on the way. It's quite common actually for probes going to outer solar system bodies to take some photos as they pass through the asteroid belt. Um, uh, Hayabusa, Hayabusa uh, Musa C was what the uh, at, uh, return mission to uh, Itakawa, so they first visited uh, that area uh, in the previous missions, uh, and then uh, um, uh, Itakawa was visited, targeted for, for a visit and with the sample return. It's really interesting actually if you go to the ESA or the NASA website and read about these, these, these kind of missions, for the most part, they, they sound like sticky, state, sticky tape and glue kind of missions. Uh, even Hayabusa, which was quite a successful mission, they lost a solar panel, uh, one of the iron drives didn't work, they weren't able to fire thrusters, but yet they still figured out how to actually land and return some samples uh, using whatever they could. And most of these missions have near disasters during some part of their mission, so it's not a terribly easy exercise to get out there, even just to take a look and, and land and have a wander around. Um, Genesis mission was really about capturing solar wind uh, and sending, returning that to Earth. Um, another comet sampling uh, mission, Stardust, uh, uh, flew past an asteroid on its way. Again, some more flybys. Um, there is the NEAR um, mission where they're attempting to rendezvous with uh, Eros. Um, and again, Galileo, as we went to Jupiter, uh, uh, had a stopover in the asteroid belt as well. Returning to the Hayabusa mission, uh, this was a sample return mission. Hayabusa actually had two landers on board. One of them was the size of a coffee can, and the, uh, the idea there was to use that to just uh, trial actually trying to land an object uh, on the surface. Uh, and uh, then they later dropped a, a slightly larger lander and collected a sample. Uh, and that was returned to Earth, uh, and they got uh, all of 1,500 dust particles, uh, which were uh, confirmed to be uh, of, of origin from uh, uh, Itakawa itself. Itakawa is one of these uh, rubble piles. Uh, on board the Hayabusa, they had LIDAR, uh, spectrometry capabilities, the, the uh, near-infrared uh, cameras, uh, and by monitoring the orbit of Hayabusa around uh, Itakawa, they were able to map out the gravitational potential field of, uh, of uh, the asteroid Itakawa. 
And uh, when they did that, they discovered that there are gravity highs and there are gravity lows, which are basically hills and valleys. Now, my uh, mate from Uruguay, Gonzalo, uh, was poring over these images uh, and uh, he noticed something quite remarkable, and that was that the locations where you found the largest boulders were for the, large, for the most part in the locations of the gravity highs and the locations where there was lots of dust and finer particles were in the gravity lows. So the big boulders are on the hills and the dust is in the valleys. And that's rather interesting. He also found evidence of that in a number of other asteroids as well, that in fact there is segregation uh, of rocks in these rubble pile asteroids. So Gonzalo was very interested to try to understand how that occurs. And his hypothesis, uh, going back to about 2008, is that these rubble pile asteroids undergo what's known as the Brazil nut effect. So the Brazil nut effect is one of the most famous physics experiments. Uh, it's very cool. If you place a Brazil nut in the bottom of a jar and then cover it with peanuts and gradually shake the jar, the Brazil nut will actually float and it will float up to the surface of the peanuts. It's called the Brazil nut effect because of the observation by physicists in the 60s that at the local bar with the free peanut nibblies, at the end of the evening, all that was ever left were the small monkey nuts. All the Brazil nuts and larger walnuts and so on had been eaten. Now, either no one likes monkey nuts or there was something else going on. And what was going on was segregation. Essentially, finer material in a granular material that's shaken is able to fall through the cracks and fall around and underneath the larger particles. And over time, through granular ratcheting, those larger particles get floated up through that granular material. So uh, Gonzalo was interested to know, firstly, can the Brazil nut effect explain the segregation observed by the Indicawa? And secondly, he wanted to know, well, how do these uh, rubber piles actually vibrate? What is the source of the vibration that causes the segregation if there is indeed uh, 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 the Brazil nut effect? And his hypothesis, working hypothesis, still to be fully tested, is that in fact when there are impacts of smaller asteroids on the surface of these rubber piles, they actually induce seismic waves, shaking waves, through the rubber pile. And those seismic waves are responsible for the size segregation that occurs in the rubber pile. How am I going for time? About halfway through? Yeah. yeah, good. Okay, so um, there's an interesting challenge, however, in, in testing this hypothesis. And the challenge is, is that this guy resides in a physical part of our solar system that's really quite different to what we're used to down here on Earth. Uh, it's microgravity for a start. So rather than being stuck in a gravitational field where the vast majority of physical phenomena is essentially governed by the gravitational field in which we reside, that is not actually the case in the asteroid belt. Each of these particles undergoes self-gravity with all of the other particles forming up this boulder with much weaker interactions than nearby other asteroids as well. But those self-gravity forces are very small indeed. In fact, they're so small that the cohesive forces between the atoms of those rubble pile particles, the so-called van der Waals forces, are actually stronger than the gravitational forces. If that were the case here on Earth, I could quite easily walk over here and walk straight out the wall and across the ceiling and stand there and quite comfortably present from the ceiling. <laughs> I won't try it. Not today. <laughs> Interestingly, however, if I had to roll my pet gecko from home, my pet gecko would have had no trouble walking across the ceiling. And in fact, that gecko is using van der Waals forces. Microscopic analysis of the pads of gecko feed shows that it has uh, nanometer-sized ripples of skin and muscle on the surface of the gecko's pads, which are of sufficient size and geometry to actually induce large enough van der Waals forces of cohesion or attraction between the pads of the gecko feet and another surface for it to be able to hold up its weight and stick to the ceiling. So van der Waals forces and self-gravity are in fact playing a very interesting game when it comes to these rubble pile asteroids. Self-gravity causes the material to collapse onto itself and to form a pile and then the van der Waals forces essentially keep it together uh, in a cohesion-like uh, manner. 
both gravity and Van der Waals forces are long-range forces, many body forces. Every particle experiences a force from every other particle in its neighbourhood, and that force drops off like 1 over r squared, whereas the distance between those two bodies, just like Newton's law of gravitation. So conducting laboratory experiments to try and test these ideas, like segregation for, uh, being uh, playing a role in the formation of the Ikawa, is rather difficult here on Earth. And it's rather expensive to take these kind of experiments to the International Space Station and conduct them in microgravity there, although there is a mission about to be uh, 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 launched to take a, an experiment to the International Space Station to have a look at how piles of rubble uh, are affected by an impact tool. Uh, the main thrust of that research, of course, is to figure out what happens if we were to fire a missile at one of these things, if it happened to be uh, heading towards the Earth, much like the, uh, the uh, Armageddon uh, movie. In any case, laboratory experiments on Earth start with the sort of experiments that we would uh, uh, be quite familiar here at, uh, at the JKMRC, so laboratory sandbox tests. Taking gravel and other granular materials and first subjecting them to impact <coughs> loading. Now, the gun laws in, in uh, Uruguay are somewhat less strict than Australia. Uh, so, Gonzalo and his buddies have purloined a, a basement of the physics building where they use slingshots and air guns to uh, impact granular material uh, with a high speed pro uh, projectile. Obviously, uh, and then they measure the accelerations and the vibrations of the accelerometers and pressure uh, load cells uh, that travel through that granular media to get an understanding for why soil so of those travel through unconsolidated piles of rubble. While I was in Uruguay with Gonzalo, he kindly agreed to take me on a tour of Colonia, which was about 200 kilometres away from Montevideo which is the, the old capital city uh, of, uh, of Uruguay. Now, I suspected uh, that he was just being nice and wanted to show me around his, his countryside, but in actual fact, he had an ulterior motive, as all good experimentalists do. He wanted to, to uh, go and visit an old chimney stack, uh, which was at the, the, the port there, and uh, uh, with the help of a theodolite and a laser meter, we measured the height of this chimney stack uh, for the purposes of determining whether it was tall enough to conduct microgene experiments on Earth. And of course the way that's done is to set up your experiment in a box at the top of a large tower and drop the experiment. And if the tower is high enough and you've got a clear drop, you'll get a few seconds of free fall in which to conduct your experiment. And it turns out that particular chimney stack, which is the real reason why it took me to play it, uh, was not quite high enough. It only goes to about two and a half seconds, the free fall. Uh, but it turns out that there was actually a fire escape at the, one of the campuses of the university that we looked at in the following week. Uh, we enclosed a fire escape with a, a direct drop down through the middle that gave, gave it three and a half seconds of free fall. So they're, they're presently going through the occupational health and safety uh, <laughs> issues with uh, dropping one of these uh, projectile impact experiments uh, through a tower uh, inside the university and it will be very carefully set up with high speed cameras and so forth. This is a one shot experiment. Things aren't going to be good when we get to the bottom. <laughs> um, so one shot experiment, three or four seconds of free fall to fire a projectile into a granular material and measure and observe the ejector as well as hopefully the passage of the, the wave through that granular material. Obviously experiments like this are very difficult, costly and time consuming to do uh, here on Earth. And once again, numerical modelling uh, is looked to as an option to try and get a better understanding of the physics involved. Which brings us back to my favourite slide, which seems to appear in almost every one of my presentations, the discrete element method. Astronomers, in fact, use the discrete element method quite frequently to look at planetary dynamics. Uh, as most of you will know, the discrete element method basically involves having a large number of spherical particles, each that interact with its neighbours through simple forces, that's F equals MA, Newton's second law, and by integrating Newton's second law over time, we can calculate the velocities of displacements of those particles and new forces and so forth. It's computationally quite expensive, 
Um, and the standard discrete element method algorithm is one in which we specify where the particles are, what type of forces they get. Then we construct a neighbor table which tells us which particles are near or adjacent to each other. We compute pair forces and the net forces on particles and update their position and velocities. Now, a naive discrete element method algorithm in constructing this neighbor table will undergo a search whereby it will check to see how far. Whoa, come on, go back. Did not do it again. Okay. Okay. Okay, so a naive neighbor search will take each particle in turn and measure its distance to every other particle to determine whether it's near enough to interact. That's a calculation that's of order n squared uh, complexity where n is the number of particles. And n squared uh, algorithms are essentially impractical for computational science purposes. They are so slow that you cannot actually do any useful science with an n-squared algorithm. So computational scientists do everything in their means to try and avoid n-squared problems. So the typical method in the discrete element method is to use a trick like this smart neighbor search algorithm. I'm not going to talk too much about it, but basically what we do is we divide up our space into a grid and when we're looking for the neighbours of this guy, instead of searching the entire space, we only have to search the neighbouring grid cells. And that reduces the complexity down to something of order n, about 20 to 50 n as opposed to n squared, where n can be as large as a million uh, particles in DEM simulations. That makes DEM practical enough to do interesting stuff. But when we come to self-gravity, uh, we have a problem because self-gravity in and of itself is in fact an n-squared calculation. It's a many-body calculation. Every single particle in the DEM will experience a gravitational force from every single other particle. And when they move relative to each other, we've got to recalculate that gravitational potential every single time step. It's n-squared. It is not going to scale. We are not going to be able to use uh, a numerical calculation to do self-gravity directly. And this is where Gonzalo Smarts came into play. He's come up with a method to approximate self-gravity using a trick which generically is called multipolar methods. The idea is, is that if we wish to know what is the gravitational potential at this cell here marked in red, due to all of the particles in all of the surrounding cells, uh, we can actually do this in two stages. We take a small area around that grid and do the actual n squared out of calculation. If that small area is small enough, then it doesn't take too long. And then for this is getting annoying. Here we go. And then for all the surrounding particles there, they're far enough away from that location that we can essentially assume that all the particles in a given grid cell can just be agglomerated together as a single mass located at the centre of mass of those particles. So we go through all the other grids and we calculate the centre of mass and the total mass in each of those grid cells as re represented by these green uh, dots here. Uh, and that tells us an equivalent mass of a single particle uh, at those locations which we can then use to calculate and update the gravitational potential of that side there. Once we've done that for all those grid cells, we basically have a gravitational potential field at any given location in our simulation space, and we simply need to refer to that field to calculate the gravitational force acting on particles within a given grid cell. When we do this properly, the calculation comes down to a order n log n. It is approximate, however, uh, so you have to be a bit careful with the numerical approximations that come from this algorithm. Uh, so the main purpose for my trip to Uruguay was in fact to help Gonzalo implement this MATLAB version of this algorithm in ESA's particle. Uh, designed to be able to run very high resolution simulation on supercomputers of course, because that's what ESA's particle is good at. Uh, and uh, in order to implement that algorithm, he actually got some uh, support from his computer science department. They do a much better job of collaborating across uh, the departments in Uruguay than 
that I see here at the University of Queensland for the most part. A great collaboration going with the Computer Science Department uh, where they had vacation students and master students working on implementing the calculation of that gravitational field using the multipole method in ESA's particle, distributing that to the worker processes and implementing the force calculations. But when I arrived in Europe, why they had a problem? And the problem is represented here. So we're trying to look at two gravel, uh, gravel pile asteroids that are meant to be orbiting each other. Uh, but in implementing the calculations, there's a couple of things that are wrong here. The first thing, which is obvious, is that these two asteroids simply collide with each other, even though we've set up a situation where they should orbit each other. And this was a, meant to be a simple test of cell gravity, and it certainly was a good test because it showed that the, the calculations just actually don't work. Um, so we had a problem, there was a mathematical problem, but there were also some other major computational challenges. One of the major computational challenges which I was able to help them fix while I was there uh, was that they were calculating this gravitational potential field even for locations in the simulation where no particles were likely to be for a long period of time. So if we go back to the start of this simulation, what was it? Okay. okay. We'll note that these two objects only fill part of the space, particularly initially. Uh, so we're calculating the gravitational field out in these areas all the time where there are no particles. And that was a wasting an inordinate amount of time. In fact, our calculations suggested that it was probably doing 100 times more calculations per time step. Uh, or, or per gravity uptake time step than it needed to. Uh, it turned out that ESA's particle already had information about where particles are and how fast they were moving. So by passing that information across to the gravity code, we could basically say, hey, within this next period of time, there's no chance that a particle will enter this cell. So we just don't bother calculating the gravitational potential for those cells. Uh, that potentially could have given us 100 times speed up. Now, for, for those who have actually played with optimising computer codes, there's a rule of thumb. You will only ever find one ten times speed up in your code. And then you might find a five times speed up, and you'll probably find two or three two times speed ups. But finding a hundred times speed up in a code never happens. That's the rule of thumb. So I was quite interested in the possibility of actually getting a hundred times speed up simply by optimising the calculation using a different additional information from the, the DEM name search algorithm. As it turned out, uh, we didn't get 100 times, we only got 50 times, so it was a bit disappointing. Um, but after having fixed a couple of problems, it was a really intensive three-week period. There's something nice about going and collaborating with someone for a two or three-week period where you can just focus on the problem uh, for that period and not have any other distractions. So after this three week period, during which I also taught some of the students there how to use this particle, we managed to do this orbital simulation here. Okay. Um, Gonzalo informed me only two weeks ago that they have also been having a, another look at their code and we've now actually achieved the 500 times speed up. So we got the 50 times speed up from this uh, and then he found the 10 times speed up uh, in the actual gravity, uh, gravitational potential field calculation as well. So uh, this has now become a very practical code for doing very large scale simulations of asteroid formation, uh, the impact on asteroids, and potentially in the future a test bed for methods for capturing asteroids for mining purposes, diverting asteroids to avoid natural disaster and, and, and so forth. This is one of his most recent simulations. It's a pretty simple little, little one. So essentially we're impacting the surface of a, of a little uh, uh, rubble pile asteroid. We've got some ejector and then that ejector actually falls back onto the surface again through the gravitational interaction. So we're pretty happy uh, with the way that the code is looking now. There are only about two or three other codes in the world that can actually do this self-gravity calculation and the discrete calculations. Gonzalo has also got a new student and recognising that the overall potential form of Van der Waals forces is actually identical to 
that of gravity or self-gravity. We've also implemented Van der Waals forces in this particle using the self-gravity calculation. And that could be potentially interesting for combination as well, because Van der Waals forces are critical in uh, absorbing the energy that we call surface energy when fractures form in rocks. Van der Waals forces interplay with the short, or the short range repulsive forces between atoms within a rock uh, to store elastic energy on the surfaces of fractures and that in fact is the comminution energy that gets absorbed <coughs> when we break a rock. So with, with the DEM calculations that Gonzalo has now implemented, we should be able to actually study that phenomenon in quite some detail as well. And we're going to have time. We're probably pretty bored by now. Should we be concerned about asteroids? Since I've got a history with earthquakes and I don't mind scaring uh, the daylights out of people when it comes to natural hazards, the answer, of course, is yes, we should be scared. Very, very, very scared. But just not very frequently. <laughs> Okay, this is uh, the 20-year period where NASA has been tracking the uh, disintegration of small asteroids in Earth's atmosphere. Unlike if I plot earthquake epicenters, there's one interesting feature here. There doesn't appear to be any pattern to it. So basically, any part of the Earth's surface can potentially have an asteroid impact. I hope it's gone again. Is this a good time, Alice, to ask for a new laptop? <laughs> <laughs> um, maybe take the USB first. <laughs> 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 they took you one. <laughs> <laughs> I'll give you a terabyte one. Yep. Yep. I'll give you a terabyte one. So nowhere is safe. That's what this map is telling us. Um, roughly speaking, it doesn't really make much difference between whether it's day or night, which kind of makes some sense. It shouldn't matter. Uh, in terms of the energy uh, release, they can go from one gigajoule up to about a million gigajoules. These, of course, are asteroids that didn't make it to Earth's surface. However, if they do make it near the Earth's surface or into the atmosphere, it can be rather bad in a number of different ways. This is uh, an image from uh, Siberia uh, after the 1908 Tunguska event. Uh, this is thought to be possibly uh, which entered Earth's atmosphere. Uh, it exploded about nine kilometers above the Earth's surface. It flattened 2,000 square kilometers of forest and charred grilled a large number of reindeer, apparently. Uh, about 80 million trees were knocked down. Uh, the explosion was heard up to 1,200 kilometres away. Uh, some people in the UK thought that they perhaps might have actually felt vibrations in tall buildings. And it was like dropping 185 Hiroshima bombs all at once. Asteroids had an enormous capacity to release a large amount of energy. This was an atmospheric event. Obviously, if they hit the ground, they can form a very large crater with ejector that goes up into the atmosphere. That ejector uh, can uh, blanket uh, the atmosphere for quite a long period of time, causing a semi-greenhouse effect and changing weather patterns, uh, much like volcanic eruptions. If they land in the ocean, they can form a tsunami, and those tsunamis can be hundreds of metres high, whereas the largest earthquakes can only produce tsunamis about 20 plus metres high. These could be 200 to 300 metres, and there is evidence in the geological record that in fact that has occurred. Uh, so they're not to be taken lightly. But thankfully, nature has a habit of keeping the, the, uh, the really big events for last. They're very infrequent. 
They're about 10,000 times less frequent than large magnitude earthquakes, which occur about once every 50 years somewhere in the world, the largest magnitude ones. So we're looking at 50 to 100,000 years on average between very large impacts. But we have had some notable ones. Uh, a 10 kilometer wide asteroid, so not terribly large, uh, is thought to have struck the Earth 65 million years ago. This was the Cretaceous event that, that uh, we were talking about. Um, it, it hit somewhere in Mexico. Um, does someone here want to pronounce that? Where is it? Future Loop. Future Loop? Yeah. That'll do. <laughs> um, so that's about 10 kilometers across 65 million years ago. The planet at that time was inhabited by uh, dinosaurs. Uh, not for much longer after that. So the mass extinction event associated with this impact uh, basically wiped out, what was it, 99, 98% of all life on the planet. Um, there's some strong geological evidence for this. There is a layer of iridium uh, in the stratigraphy all the way around the world. Asteroids are very high in levels of iridium compared to the Earth's crust uh, generally, because iridium has actually been differentiated into our mantle. Uh, so that layer of iridium uh, enrichment around the Earth's crust uh, was probably brought to the atmosphere when this crashed down, thrown into the atmosphere and then laid down in the geological stratigraphy. About 3.26 billion years before that though, in present day Africa, there was uh, there is evidence for an asteroid hitting us that was at least 37 kilometers wide. It produced a 500 kilometer wide crater, uh, evidence for which still exists. And this guy here may in fact have triggered plate tectonics on this planet. So uh, prior to this early stage, in the first one billion years of the Earth, the crust was essentially a, a, a solid shell. And then this guy hit us it basically caused the mantle to start to overturn. It stirred the mantle. And that stirring of the mantle is thought to be what has actually started up plate tectonics on this planet. So yes, asteroids are something to be concerned about. I think that'll do. I hope you found it interesting. I apologize for all the technical disruptions and all that sort of thing, but in any case, it is what it is.